We all know what Remembrance Day is. It is the one day of the year we mourn the sacrifices of all of those who we lost in the war. We wear a poppy and take part in a two-minute silence and then get back to our busy lives forgetting the importance of our lost heroes. However, the war was not so long ago. There are people alive to this day who suffered the harsh conditions of the concentration camps, fought and helped out during the war, and even fell in love. Love is what brings everyone closer. So as you hold your silence this Remembrance Day, remember your loved ones during these uncertain times and hold them close. In our video, we will be sharing three stories from our members here at H Concern Luton. But before we share our stories, here is a message from the director about what Remembrance Day means to her. So the day we opened was actually the 11th of November 1994. And that was our first charity shop, which was in Manchester Street, formerly Miss Betty's Mode. Been empty for a number of years and we had, in the weeks running up to opening, a real flurry of activity getting it redecorated and kitted out. Um, on the day, we decided to do a big launch and so we had the mayor come, the fabulous Desleine Stewart. Um, for those that remember Desleen, she was like a tiny Tina Turner and she was charismatic, wonderful woman. And we also had um, a very tall man dressed in a dragon suit to promote winter warmth. And the idea being that get your boiler checked and let's see, you know, that people have enough warmth and insulation throughout the winter. So with the two of them, um, actually in the shop, as we opened, we opened at nine o'clock. The shop was full to absolutely full to bursting. Everybody came from Luton and uh, it was absolutely marvellous. But at 11 o'clock, we closed the doors and had a two minute silence outside the shop. And um, it was a very amusing thing to see, you know, the wonderful Desleen standing there in a black and white check coat right next to this enormous dragon, both observing a minute si to the two minute silence. It was one of those moments I'll never forget. John Wood. I got called up when I was 18 in October 45. So I didn't see the war, but I had a reminiscion of the things that happened during the war. Worth it. And I finished up as a cook, not having any qualifications. I was expected to, <laughs> to carry on with a shovel to make these cookhouse. Now, the cookhouse consisted of a hole in the ground, like being in a cemetery, with a corrugated iron on top, a Bunsen burner on the end, and a flame keeping everything hot with the dixes on it. And they locked us in the vegetable locker, of our own clothing with cold water. You shave with cold water. And it was terrible. Mm -hmm. But the man brought it, he was quite pleased with what we were doing. We get, we're getting by with nothing. Nice hole with a hand on the ground for 460 men on your own at night. Mm -hmm. So we got 20 buckets for, for tea. 
-hmm. and it, they held 20 points in, in a bucket. And so that's 414. Mm -hmm. I got them organized and they had to cut the bread by hand, mm -hmm. no machinery at all, just by hand. And when I was small, we used to have a galvanized pole with a handle on the other end. We used to have a bath in. We had two of them to do the porridge. Mm -hmm. We had one bowl that we had for the Scotch, and we put salt in there in their porridge. The English. We put sugar in there, <laughs> and I managed to do everything that's required of me. Oh, he wouldn't say a reason. I mean, when I was short, fella, fella, they had me working like a horse. Working radiators at the cookers. I started with on the cookers, and then I went it progressed onto radiators. And the next room, they call it the wire room, where the ladies were. And that's where I first met the boy. <laughs> it was uh, terrible. And evidently, she had been bombed out from Scotland in 1941 with the bombers from Germany. And that's the way they come to Luton to there. But she was very saucy, Scotch. <laughs> and she was only four foot eight. And they, and they used to call me Big John. I was five foot four. <laughs> My name is Eileen Larkin. I was born in Jersey and moved over to the UK in 1940. Or the day before the Germans had taken over France and they reckoned that the next day they would want Jersey and take in. Winston Churchill said that we he wanted to evacuate the island. He didn't want it bombed or anything done to it. So uh, who would be willing to go to the mainland, to be evacuated to the mainland next day? And um, my mother said, yes, she would want to come with my brother and myself. My father came to see us off in the morning. And um, then the, the crew was advised that there was a U-boat in the area and to watch out and um, could he get some help in case there was trouble and the, the crew would have to look after the boat. They would want somebody to look after the women and children. So he got on the boat and um, we were all supposed to go to Weymouth but we arrived at Southampton with being chased. It was midnight, nobody at all there. Um, absolutely dark, uh, concrete, where we stayed all night until um, we had nothing to eat, because no, no, nobody was expecting us. And um, next morning, the um, Salvation Army came in and brought us tea. And then they took us all to a dog racing track to sit around to be told where we had to go from there. And um, we had, to, they brought us some sandwiches and we had sandwiches there. And then they were, somebody came and said that we were going to be taken to Barnsley to be evacuated. The train would be coming to evacuate us up there. And um, we all went. Um, the, when we got there, my, the, my mother and those children were in one hall, my father was in another hall, and of course it was midnight when we got there, and we went to see how my father was next morning to meet up. <laughs> he was on crutches, he'd fallen between the train and the platform. So um, he had no change of clothes, no nothing because he just got on the boat and eventually um, I got um, evacuated with two of my aunts that had come over on the boat with us and my mother and my brother and my father uh, didn't get evacuated because the bombs, you know, the bombers going over to London and you could see London all lit up in flames and uh, we were in 
a little cottage, I think it was two cottages or something, at the bottom of a field. And luckily, the bombs were dropped in the top of this field. Mm -hmm. so warehouse mm -hmm. we used to send the um uh, all the tobacco i was mm -hmm. in the tobacco department and we used to send it out to the naffy um the you know the canteens and all that mm -hmm. and uh, some couple of women came down from Rargate, they'd been bombed out and they said to us, have you never thought of putting your label or something in a packet of tobacco so as you could meet a pen pal? And uh, we said, no, we'd never thought of that. Anyway, I did it and the supervisor in the canteen of the world that was in the department, she did it. And um, George wrote to me, he said, could we meet up? And I went to the station in Guildford to meet him. He went to meet me. We didn't recognise one another. Both went home. The months afterwards, Christmas was in between. And um, where we lived in Guildford, they sent my address on to uh, Manchester. And he wrote. And uh, we got together again and we met in Manchester. Mm -hmm. We got married in 1947. Remembrance Day. We just always think back, you know, on leaving the house and my mother just shut the door on everything. So she, I mean, built up since she got married and it's just shut and walked away that she thought my father was going to go back. But of course he, did, he never did go back. So uh, the family that were over there just took the house and took what they could out of it and used it. There was nothing we could do mm -hmm. because we were only allowed a pillowcase clothes to bring with us so we had nothing. I think of all things my mother bought her marriage lines. <laughs> she often says why did I bring those because I could have got them in <laughs> But I think it was just a case if you raw picked up what you thought. You can't worry about things, can you? They happen, they happen. I mean, my mother just got all her home together and everything and just had to walk out. Mm. You, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, there's nothing there because um, some of the relations had stayed in Jersey all the wartime and they needed um, linen and pots and pans and different things. So they'd just taken what they'd saved from my mother's house mm -hmm. you can't you know you just got to go along with what what's there haven't you sort of thing my name is olivia and i was a post lady during the war and and she said it's this little girl's birthday would i deliver the little puppy so I said, well, I'm not allowed to do that. So he said, would you do me a favour? I knocked the door and this little girl answered. I said, happy birthday from your daddy because he was abroad and he sent this little puppy to you. And I'll never remember that little girl's face. Aww. She said, oh, lovely. He had a choice, so I went back to coal mine. So anyway... One of these soldiers that was with her, <laughs> sort of, sort of, we met up. He sort of took me out and that. And um, that's how it all started. So um, I asked my mum and dad if I could get married. And my mum didn't want me to get married, not doing the war. But anyway, I did. I finally got married. And... Um, I was 20 when I got married. I'd been 21 in the June, so I was only 20. He was 21. I hadn't met any of his people at all, so I got married. I corresponded with them. And um, then we got married. I brought my dress, my veil. I lived with my sister. 
because by this time my husband had gone back so there was just the two of us and um, my husband got sent to to um, France in, for D-Day so I was a post girl then and they did give me some time off you know you couldn't you couldn't just take time off work then you had to get permission so I went to see him, my foreman or whatever, and I, I remember that to go to the head postmaster for him to give me some time off. When he'd just gone back, he came home again on the leave. The, the war in Europe was over, and he got sent out to, to India, and they weren't, wasn't going to give me any more time off. So I remember, I know I did have to have time off. They got managed to get me time off. So off he goes to India. When he gets there, I realised I was pregnant. So of course, I had my little, my first son, and he didn't see his dad till he was about 15, 16 months old. And, um, you know, just sent him photographs and all that sort of thing. And then he came home. I went back with my sister and I found I was having another baby. People were very friendly because uh, it was so many years ago. Times were different. You see, you didn't get all the help they get today. You you know what I mean? And when we come up here, I mean, we didn't have very much. Didn't have very much at all. But everybody was in the same boat then, sort of thing. You know, unless you got really well off people. You know, I mean, I came from a family of five, and I often look back and think how hard my mum worked. We never went without anything. She worked all the time, you know, had no television to put. It makes you realise, I suppose. Mind you, the situation we're going through today is a lot worse than the war. Because I can remember queuing up for food for my mum and all that sort of thing, but it was never, I mean, this situation is terrible. When I was a post lady, I posted a letter through the door. My wedding ring went in with it too. So I, I put a note quickly through the door to say it was a post lady's and I gave her the address where I lived, that I would come and pick it up. And she brought it round that same night. It, well, it was very nice of her. So. <laughs> Probably the most unusual unique Remembrance Day that any of us have ever experienced. There's not going to be the normal celebrations in the normal way, the commemoration, the remembering the people that are important. But I think the most important thing is that we remember people in our hearts. We remember those we knew, and those we didn't know, all of those who made the sacrifice of their lives, who actually went away and didn't come back, or who came back and weren't quite the same. So we all know some of those heroes. We've come across them. Mightn't have known they were heroes. But we all remember them and we're deeply thankful to them for all that they've done for us. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow Between the crosses, row on row That mark our place and in the sky The lark still bravely singing fly Scarce heard amid guns below We are the dead shot days ago We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow Loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break, break faith with us, we die. We shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders fields. Row, 